Now we can we, we can pass the floor to to Elk Dahl from from the Center for Social Innovation in Austria. Uh, please help. So Thank you very much. Because I was thinking that it's a long uh, online conference, so I put my my presentation into an interactive um, tool uh, called menti.com. So if you would want to join me in the presentation and maybe ask, answer some of the questions, uh, you would be taking out your mobile phone and visit a page called uh, www.menti.com and then you will be asked for a code and the code would be uh, the six digits 970726 to um, put in there. Um, so I hope that uh, you would follow uh, me on that. Uh, so please do that while I introduce myself briefly. So I am. Uh, my name is Elke Dahl. I was introduced already. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. yeah, Agustina. Can you put? Yeah. Can you put in the in the chat what we have to put to log to log in to Menti? On the screen, uh, if you go, yeah. if you the screen, it's here basically. Okay, great, great, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have been introduced as a as Austrian. Uh, at the moment, we are talking to each other uh, from Brussels. So um, I I like very much the internationality of uh, this call as well. Uh, I coordinate the project S4D4C, and I see some some nice hearts coming in. So some people have managed to to create the connection. So that's that's great. Um, in order to introduce you to this S4D4C, which is a bit of a mouthful, uh, the S stands for the science, and the D for the diplomacy, and the project title comes from using science uh, for diplomacy for addressing societal challenges. Um, this is a Horizon 2020 research project. And uh, we started uh, almost two years ago, and we have about one more year to go. And the project is uh, a consortium of 10 partners that are representing research partners on the one hand side. So you see uh, several universities uh, that are members but also kind of practitioner partners, so to say, uh, or training partners like the Diplomatic Academy based in Vienna, or the World Academy of Sciences, or also the, the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology that are kind of implementing science diplomacy. So in this kind of, let's say, co-creative um, environment, we are trying to work on, on science diplomacy on empirical research uh, that we do uh, case studies, uh, but also uh, creating like a network facility, uh, some dialogue. We are working also on um, in one work package on a governance framework. Uh, there we will also have uh, first results early next year. We are trying to pull together uh, knowledge resources on uh, that we are also presenting on our website, and we are inviting basically the broader community to uh, get also involved and uh, we would we're really looking forward uh, eventually to also get the results from the oil lack focus that we might be either can present as a knowledge resource or as part of uh, also our work on training so we had uh, physical trainings already where we tested some training materials and uh, we are going to have some online trainings as well. So this is um, the, the broad outline of this project. And in order to test now if uh, this has worked, if you have been able to log into this um, menti.com with this code, I have here like a first question that I'm not even assuming that you know how to answer. So don't worry, just click something to see if it works. Um, because the point that I want to make here 
is that uh, this S4D4C project is uh, basically one out of uh, three projects. And I would like to draw your attention on a project called LSIP that has already finished and had uh, already several results being published. And uh, another project called INSIGHT. And uh, apparently the participants that are following me here uh, know very well. So yes, these are three uh, currently running science diplomacy projects. Um, thanks for that. So let's see. Uh, I would like to ask the participants, and now this is an easy question that I would really hope that we can all uh, fill in and uh, take a little bit of time. So uh, I want to, to know about yourself. If you are uh, a diplomat, a science counselor, attaché or advisor, a researcher, a policy officer, a grant manager, or um, something completely different. So we have quite a few researchers. Uh, I, I hope that our diplomats might be still online. That would be quite cool. Um, I'll, I'm actually really waiting for some more people. Um, but let's see. Let's see what I what I have to continue to tell you. Um, because I was also wondering if you are actually involved in international diplomacy or in science cooperation or in science advice. We can skip this question because basically I wanted to uh, hint on one of our conceptual works that we have, uh, that we have made here uh, that are linking these, uh, these three aspects and that are actually really making the point that diplomacy is no longer the, the thing that only nation states and diplomats are doing, but that we can identify a lot of different uh, stakeholders, like we're listing them in this graph that you're seeing online, like the research institutions themselves, the SME, the funding organizations and the universities that are bringing through their science advice and input into the international diplomacy field. They're partnering in advisory groups, in scientific projects, or by their analytical work that they're doing, um, that they're truly providing this input into the international diplomacy, which uh, is also kind of like improving the science cooperation aspect. And not all science co cooperation needs to be science diplomacy, but we see that in many cases we can we can argue uh, that the overlaps are quite uh, quite large, and that when we are doing cooperation agreements or creating some transnational research organizations, large research infrastructures, or joint funding programs, a lot of it has an aspect of science diplomacy, even. Uh, maybe if the foreign policy stakeholders aren't really involved in them themselves. Um, that the funding organizations, the research institutions, or the foreign offices, or like Institut Francais, or also the BAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, all these stakeholders have uh, a strong, strong component uh, in the science diplomacy concept. And also, we're saying that not everything that is happening is actually fitting into these uh, three categories that stem from the discussion of the Royal Society uh, AAAS report, what uh, Agustina has mentioned, but that we conceptually can, can go broader and actually expand on that as well. So we see science diplomacy uh, as a series of practices um, that are kind of like between science and technology and foreign policy. I think we've heard that already before. Um, and what, what S4D4C has done was actually 
preparing a declaration. It's called the Madrid Declaration on Science Diplomacy, where we have uh, outlined the benefits of science diplomacy and, the, and a certain kind of vision for science diplomacy, um, where, where we are kind of like defining how the, the decisions about the global challenges are being formed and how uh, the interests beyond the scientific ones are, can be used to directly and indirectly advance the diplomatic goals. So you see this, um, the slide that we have on benefits of science diplomacy here, uh, again on the, on the screen on my presentation. Um, and then we have the, the Madrid Declaration then continues to actually, so, to actually outline a few principles of science diplomacy, uh, which I am listing here on that slide now. And um, these principles, I would just ask you if you are still with me uh, to vote which ones are the more important ones for you. So that's quite nice. Uh, we see that uh, there are quite different, uh, different aspects of it. Uh, the, the value to citizens, uh, here we, we really say that it's important that science diplomacy uh, improves the international relations, that it, it comes down and arrives also at the citizen level. Um, when we talk about methodological diversity, it's also about considering uh, explicit and implicit types of science diplomacy, um, but also it's a little bit the, the discussion that we are having if, for example, the social sciences and humanities are not, are, are probably underutilized because we are looking too much on the, on the STEM fields, uh, on science, technology and uh, kind of like, mm, yeah, the technological areas. Um, Demonstrable impact, I hope this uh, yeah, speaks for itself. Uh, so we hope that it can also be measured, the kind of science diplomacy that we're doing and that we're going to see uh, if there are unintended effects as well uh, that we might want to analyze and, um, and be informed about. Um, we should uh, walk the talk. So I think if we're saying that um, science should put evidence uh, into policy, I, we, we think that also it's very important that uh, diplomacy uh, and science diplomacy is kind of like evidence-based. So um, we think that this can be content-related. So for example, scientific evidence on climate change, global inequality or cybersecurity, but it can also be context-related knowledge about a specific uh, national innovation system or, or regional innovation system, and also process related. Uh, for example, to evaluate knowledge on the effects and the outcome of science diplomacy intervention. I'm, I'm a bit sad that nobody clicked on that one. Um, collaboration and inclusion. Uh, science diplomacy is certainly a multi-actor effort um, and capacity building. The, the stakeholders will certainly benefit uh, from an exchange and some further capacity building um, activities. So a lot of people agree, seem to agree uh, with me on this one. Um, and uh, last but not least, but I do also think that it is very important uh, to state that in terms of when we're talking about science diplomacy, we still need to hold the value of the independence of science uh, high. So even if uh, science diplomacy talks about the interests and how we can support diplomatic interests with science, uh, it is very important that the independence of science and academic freedom are not uh, distorted by some probably ideological goals or something like that. So. These are the, I, I, I talked a little bit more in detail about what we are having here in the Madrid Declaration as 
as principles and uh, thanks a lot for also engaging with those principles um, uh, of the people that have uh, voted with me on, on these ones. Um, so if you are interested to support this Madrid Declaration on Science Diplomacy, uh, it's basically to read in detail uh, the Madrid Declaration is on our website. And uh, you can read here uh, the whole declaration in more details and also download it. And then you can see who has already uh, supported the, the Madrid Declaration on Science Diplomacy. Um, so if you are interested to support it as well, please feel free to send us an email and we will happily put your, uh, your name as well on on the signature so I'm, I'm happy to, to receive that and I'm happy to see uh, your your general interest I did not put the the no option actually on this one because I thought I yeah well if you don't get in touch with me I, I know that uh, it didn't uh, address address your attention affect your attention but I'm quite happy to that some of you are really interested. Um, so our project has uh, has some case studies, as I mentioned before, and uh, I don't want to use my time uh, extensively to talk about uh, the different uh, particular aspects of it. Uh, but we do have one case study uh, that has. Um, a Latin American component, so to say, in it, uh, it addressed infectious diseases, and in this context, the colleagues, uh, the lead author was uh, is based at Charles University in Prague, um, but together with a whole group of researchers, they looked also at uh, the the Zika case. So um, that might be of of, of interest and of. Uh, just to highlight it and to follow up, and if you have some questions, I can uh, probably report a little bit on it. But uh, I have not personally been the researcher that developed this case study, so uh, maybe I would also have to forward your questions uh, to the colleagues. Nevertheless, I wanted to use this to highlight uh, a publication where. Uh, the European Commission reflected also on their activities uh, of the past five years, and there was a chapter on boosting international collaboration, cooperation, sorry, and science diplomacy um, within this publication. And they are so it's the, it's the perspective of the European Commission of what they were doing in uh, in terms of science diplomacy and tackling global challenges efficiently is one of their success stories and also the speaker outbreak has been particularly mentioned i'm not sure if you can read all this but it's basically here in the in the middle and i highlighted some others um, because also they relate to some uh, case studies that we're doing by, for example, looking at co-funding mechanisms like joint programming or ARNS and how um, a certain implicit science diplomacy is actually happening when funding agencies are agreeing on uh, joint funding mechanisms. Um, and uh, the other one is also the SESAMI project. I don't know if you're aware of that one because it's not obviously uh, connected. Well. I don't know if it's obvious, but it's not connected to Latin America and the Caribbean. It's a, a synchrotron, a large research infrastructure that is based in Jordan and that has uh, received a lot of support by the European uh, Union and that has also won a science diplomacy award uh, um, last year, uh, or yeah, last year uh, as, a, as an outstanding science diplomacy project. Uh, where the European Union has been really uh, highly involved in that. So, and in this publication, you can read more details uh, as to how the European Commission themselves uh, and uh, under Carlos Moedas perceived their uh, success stories on science diplomacy. And um, so, th this is also to ask you where you would 
the uh, the need in terms of uh, a better science diplomacy for between the EU and Latin America for the future. I have I have listed a few options that uh, might be um, supportive to uh, EU science diplomacy. And I want to talk a little bit that, about the fact that uh, as the S4D4C project, there are um, activities that we're, we're doing in some of those. So, for example, in terms of training workshops, I already said we did two of those training workshops uh, and we have developed a little bit kind of like a model curriculum um, that we are planning also to share uh, later on on our website when we have evaluated all the results and uh, advice that we receive about uh, future training workshops. An online training is going to be launched uh, also mid next year. Colleagues are currently working on the different modules uh, that relate to, for example, what is science diplomacy, um, how how is science diplomacy done, and uh, and so on. So um, th there is something if you would deem this useful. Um, I think we are more than happy to share with you uh, what is going to happen. Uh, simulations and training materials. So part of the training workshops that we developed uh, in this frame, we also created some uh, simulation games, like one on global health and uh, open science. Um, and we're, we're working on making those public under a, a Creative Commons license as well. So. Uh, in case some of you want to use uh, training opportunities, I hope that we will make them available in a way so that you could reuse them as well. Um, then we, as I've mentioned already on our website, we are presenting some knowledge resources. Uh, you can find those uh, here under online knowledge resources as well as a commented bibliography that is a bit more academic. The knowledge resources sources are a little bit more practical and uh, we are offering uh, a lot of at the moment uh, we're very good in the stakeholder mapping so this has been going online just recently and we're obviously working on on filling these um, but and we're also having like a geographical focus you see uh, we still certainly need some more input on uh, on Latin American stakeholders who are practicing science diplomacy. So this is a warm indication uh, to you to help us uh, fill these knowledge resources. Um, community building, we are doing that by offering a LinkedIn group on science diplomacy and also by being quite active on Twitter as well as organizing events. So we are planning our final conference in November uh, 2020 that certainly should add on uh, community building and, uh, and offering good networking opportunities. We are really looking forward to offering uh, you something that uh, gives the connection opportunities and not just uh, talk. And in terms of exchange and mobility, I also thought to, to make that a, partic oh, sorry, a particular point because I was thinking um, that uh, it's important to uh, maybe think structurally about different aspects to support the, the science diplomacy links, like uh, within the Latin American Caribbean uh, context between science and diplomacy, as well as within the EU context but also uh, across the board uh, linking uh, EU diplomacy with uh, Latin American science or linking EU science with Latin American diplomacy. Um, and again, I can just complement the setup of, the, of this workshop because it was very inspiring uh, to hear from, from uh, science diplomats uh, all over the world. Um, yeah, here I, I just mentioned a few bullet points of uh, examples. Uh, so the S4D4C project has experimented with an open doors program where uh, five uh, young researchers uh, with a very scientific profile were selected and received um, the possibility to enter into embassies 
uh, and international organizations, like more the, let's say, the diplomatic sphere. And we have now some results of those, and uh, we, we would like to promote this kind of like a success story because we think it was a very successful mechanism. Uh, we also have these joint training activities. Um, additionally, I think that co-creating, uh, for example, priorities would be an, an, an important uh, exercise. And uh, if we do research activities and we are preaching about uh, opening the research to the users and to the user groups, I think we should also think about opening our research activities uh, to the diplomatic community and we hope we, I, I would like citizen science but the diplomacy as a citizen and as a as a user of uh, our research results to really foster a collaboration and use um, instruments that are developed for example in co-creation and citizen science to develop together uh, scientific questions and address them uh, together so there, these were a few thoughts uh, of mine that I wanted to bring forward uh, in terms of the uh, my perspective on uh, EU lack cooperation. And then, sorry, I need to go back here. I wanted to have a few additional reflections um, in terms of science diplomacy. I wanted to uh, really make the point that it's not always useful to talk about science diplomacy explicitly, uh, that uh, sometimes it might be more useful to, uh, to just do it, um, because the label in itself might uh, create also some repercussions in certain groups. So as a sci scientist might actually be uh, feeling that uh, kind of like, why do I need to think about national interest? I, I'm just interested in my formula, or I'm just interested in my um, physical or biological experiments. Um, but uh, we think that implicit science diplomacy is equally important as uh, explicit one. Then uh, I think this panel, or the two panels that we had like on innovation diplomacy, science diplomacy, or let's say knowledge diplomacy um, as encompassing terms. Um, yeah, we should be just kind of like pay attention on, on what we use, but then also not be too uh, critical, uh, in my opinion, as well as with the next point, because we saw that in our case studies a lot, uh, that uh, we were looking at water diplomacy and then what is like water diplomacy, water science diplomacy, science diplomacy, etc. So um, we, we're trying to work on that and understand it better through our case studies. Um, and the same goes uh, like what reflect what, what Ramon reflected at the beginning, what actually is the EU and what is actually Latin America and the Caribbean. So I think it's quite important to uh, say that uh, the EU is composed of European stakeholders and that we are doing science diplomacy uh, all along, even if uh, the EU is probably doing less of it. Or uh, like what we can continue the argument here uh, that Ramon made at the very beginning. And uh, as a last bullet, I wanted to say that uh, I would like to continue the discussion with all of you on uh, concrete collaboration possibilities and in particular Horizon Europe. And uh, as, my, as my, my last slide, um, I thought to ask you uh, what comes to your mind thinking of a potential EU, Latin American, Caribbean science diplomacy flagship. So uh, I'm quite sure, quite um, aware that Horizon Europe is currently kind of like defining, let's say, the first calls or the, the, the approaches that uh, are, is going to be reflected in Horizon uh, Europe, even if a lot of points are still open uh, like um, also the issue of association, etc. 
but um, I think that uh, collecting ideas or co-creating ideas about potential science diplomacy flagships uh, could be one of the opportunities that we can have together. So um, if you have some further, further suggestions, I would leave that slide on. And uh, I also do have uh, a last uh, one where, where you would be invited uh, to, to let us know about some next steps uh, that we could do together. But I think I would leave this one and, and, and have the next steps discussion rather orally um, together with you and give the floor back to the organizers after this input and uh, see what else comes up uh, in terms of, um, of your ideas for uh, cooperative infrastructures, uh, understanding growth, I don't know. Uh, and we, we need to put the keywords in context, uh, and I would be very happy to hear from you about that. Okay, thank you, thank you, El. Do you do you have some some questions or comments? Hey, sorry, I wrote my question, so I thought it was visible. Sorry, um, I I just wanted to to ask uh, if it were possible that you expand. On the on the role of science diplomacy in dealing with global environmental issues and and maybe um, medical cooperation, um, you know, as you have mentioned, the Zika virus issue. Um, I mean, we I, I think that the the, the COP twenty five, for example, that is ongoing uh, right now, uh, like a very good example. Of, uh, of science diplomacy. Uh, our project is also there with a little uh, intervention on science diplomacy. And I think that uh, what the discussion on the SDGs is quite broad. And I think here bringing in or strengthening, jointly strengthening the voice of uh, the science and the scientific results is also one of the objectives that we're trying to further here. Um, th there are some people that would say that the underpinning of the SDGs with uh, science is, is, is very weak. Uh, I, I'm not that much of an expert of like how they were uh, negotiated, but I think it's a clear example of uh, a science and diplomacy kind of like interface and cooperation uh, that is that is important there, and the infectious diseases case. Um, we were seeing that uh, Zika was certainly not a game changer for science diplomacy. Uh, it was rather, as come out in the interviews, uh, Ebola for various reasons, uh, but uh, we were able to deduct. Uh, in, in the preliminary analysis. I mean, you will see that our case studies are not let f yet uh, fully available on the website because we're still working on them and they're going to be published, I think, in March uh, next year. But we, in the preliminary analysis of the interviews, we were already able to say that, of course, for example, the, the science diplomatic response depended a lot on the geographical position. Uh, like if you do interviews in, in the Czech Republic, they will tell you we didn't have a direct flight, so it wasn't that important for us or things like that. Um, and we're trying to uh, see what we get from the, from the interviews in terms of uh, results that we can, that we can uh, generalize. Um, another one uh, that we're trying to, to generalize is if science diplomacy is um, embedded or in how far science diplomacy is embedded in these kind of like national diplomatic narratives. Here we had some interviews, for example, with uh, in the UK where this global Britain concept is, uh, is quite uh, dominant at the moment. And here we see that there are differences, let's say, between the science diplomacy in the UK and the German uh, science uh, diplomacy, which uh, has is more embedded in a national discourse about excellence, 
uh, that that is more dominant in, in what we what we saw in German uh, interviews. So, and this we're trying to put then also into the European context, uh, where Sika certainly has been uh, taken up quite a bit in uh, joint funding mechanisms. And uh, here I, I can agree with the assessment of the European Commission as well, that it was actually a, a success case for the European Union to take up a challenge and actually mobilize uh, some funds. But then again, our Brazilian colleagues might disagree, uh, and I, I would be very happy to, to hear from you on that as well. Because, for example, I'm quite sure, and again, I have to say, I did not do the interviews and the case study myself, but I think that, we, that they were not very um, focused on the Brazilian side of it. They were focusing on the European side of uh, the science diplomacy response based on this challenge of the infectious diseases. And the European side clearly said that there were very different uh, responses between Zika and, 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 uh, and the Ebola uh, challenge. Yeah, so I don't know if that already kind of uh, answered your 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 question. Uh, I do see that more people are actually now putting in some ideas for, for science diplomacy flagship and medical cooperation is now here uh, one of the issues and uh, also mutuality and I think if I can say another result of the, of the interviews was that um, the science diplomacy towards Brazil was very different from the one towards Africa for the Ebola case in terms of like having partners that are working on the same eye-to-eye -eye level, while uh, the, the response in, in Africa would have been more framed under a development uh, cooperation narrative. Yeah, so I don't know if I could know if I question. Thank you very much. Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I have an, uh, uh, an opinion about that because the, the example of Zika virus is very interesting because the international and science and, tech and innovation the, in this case is uh, it had a very important factor that is a need is an international need to solve a problem. So like the Ebola, the Ebola is, is the same problem. But if we have an international interest in to solve a problem, we will have uh, international, uh, we will have uh, science, science diplomacy and science innovation applied on that. So an example, another example, another area is cybersecurity, for example or the ethics on the, uh, on the artificial intelligence. So this is, this, these two kinds of, uh, of international needs could be very interesting to credit the, the uh, science diplomacy and the diplomacy of innovation, I think. So we have, we have to, to have in, in, in our hands global problems to be solved globally uh, involving several countries. So in that case, we will have a very good, a very good, uh, a, 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 a very good exercise for science and innovation diplomacy. This is my opinion. Mm -hmm. So any other, any other, any other comment? Any other question? Okay. A question from uh, from Monica Garcia. There is a question from Monica Garcia in the chat. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the migration, the migration, the international mobility, and in face of the challenges in subjects of higher education and innovation, I would like to ask about how cultural aspects. So, if I understood the question, uh, Monica is uh, is asking about the uh, about the cultural the cultural aspects on the on the scientific science and the science you know, and science 
and diplomacy, and also in the innovation diplomacy. We have not been working on cultural diplomacy. Some of my colleagues are engaged uh, in that, but it's not part of the project. Um, I just know from, from working with some diplomats is that uh, science is subsumed on the culture from time to time. Um, so we have, but I we think have that to, from the point of view from the OILAC focus, you might be much better positioned in answering that because you have been looking at scientific, cultural, and social issues, while uh, our project clearly has a focus only on the science that then touches upon the technology, innovation, and um, and knowledge diplomacy. Yes, it's a, it's a good hint to go to the to go to the website of the Olac Fox project and, and uh, take a look and the rules on the work perspective four and five. Yes, if if you if you go there, Monica, you can you can see some information about that.